Everything around me collapses, an entire army dies, day and night burn, and officers care only for reports on the temperature. I don't know much about war, no human being has died by my hand and I have never fired live ammunition from my pistol. But I know one thing very well, no army has shown even an ounce of understanding for its men. This is a fragment of a letter written by a German soldier who participated in the Battle of Stalingrad, the fierce confrontation that took place between August 23, 1942 and February 2, 1943. The text demonstrates the precarious state of morale of the Germans during those days, the events in Stalingrad were the bloodiest of the Second World War. Casualties numbered in the millions, the city was reduced to rubble, and the horrors experienced there tore the minds of the soldiers, haunting them for the rest of their lives. Today, in this new episode of Military History, we will show you the most chilling testimonies of the German soldiers who participated in the Battle of Stalingrad. The Battle of Stalingrad occurred in the context of Case Blue, the offensive plan designed by the German army to take over southern Russia in the summer of 1942. Operation Barbarossa, with which the Third Reich had invaded the previous year the Soviet Union, had failed in its goal of subduing the communist nation. Now the Nazis were getting their revenge, and were trying to hack the Russian economy by taking control of its oil wells. Adolf Hitler was aware that Germany urgently needed fresh supplies of fuel, as it was the vital resource for his army to function. Thus, a huge contingent, led by Generals Hermann Hoth and Friedrich Paulus, marched on Stalingrad. This city was of great strategic importance due to its location. Whoever controlled it would have access to the oil of the Caucasus and, at the same time, would take over the Volga River, which would allow the mobilization of troops and resources through this route. Before we continue, we want to invite you to discover our new channel, Military Might. Here we'll carry out in-depth analyzes of the most powerful, modern and surprising weapons of war in the world. So, if you like military weaponry, you must check out Military Might. You'll find the link to the channel in the description and in the first comment. Let's go on. The Battle of Stalingrad began in August 1942 and initially the advantage went to the Germans, who managed to conquer it thanks to heavy Luftwaffe bombing and superior tanks. With the city in rubble, the fighting broke out house to house and street to street, so that by mid-November the Nazis believed themselves victorious. That, however, was nothing more than an illusion, because the Soviet counteroffensive immediately began, with the Germans locked inside Stalingrad, unable to receive help from abroad. Hitler's soldiers lived through a real hell, which they did not hesitate to put into words whenever they had the opportunity. Currently, we have abundant letters and memoirs written by them, which allow us to reconstruct the horrors of that battle. Lieutenant Colonel Friedrich Rosk commanded an infantry regiment that fought intensely against the Soviets, and he described it this way, the Russians clung to the ruins of their city with a mixture of determination, courage, and stubbornness. They were so intent on it that we could barely advance a few meters, and if they found a gap in our defenses, they would rush there and force us to organize a counteroffensive. In general, none of us slept at night, and during the day we rested in shifts, one hour of sleep, one hour on duty. In December 1942 winter began and the temperature plummeted to minus 20 degrees Celsius, wreaking havoc among the German troops. The hardships of the cold are the subject of testimonies like this, in our battalion, in the last two days alone, we had lost 60 men victims of hypothermia, and more than 30 men had fled. We had almost no ammunition left, the soldiers had eaten absolutely nothing in three days and the legs of many of them were frozen. As a result, many soldiers had limbs amputated, thus increasing the number of disabled troops they had to deal with. Stalingrad's makeshift medical wards were overwhelmed. Carl Wolf, a communications non-commissioned officer, remembers it this way, you didn't know where to start with the patients. There was nowhere to put them, and lacking the means to keep them warm, after a few hours they would freeze to death. Once the death toll reached staggering proportions it was decided to fill a ravine with corpses. It was not always possible to identify them all, sometimes up to a thousand dead lay there, unburied, because graves could not be dug in the ground hard as bone. 
On the other hand, the lack of food became common, and the high command could not organize the correct provisioning of the army. Lieutenant Colonel Rosk wrote the following. The food is poor, and there is no time or possibility to eat in peace. Last night I brought chocolates and cigarettes to my troop, it was something I saved for when the situation got desperate. However, at night the Russians attacked us and tried to capture the supplies. When there were no more rations, the soldiers crossed unsuspected limits, as this letter shows. Yesterday they gave us vodka. At that time we had just killed a dog, and the vodka suited us wonderfully. In total I have already killed four dogs, although my companions no longer want to eat them anymore. Once I even shot a magpie and boiled it. The spirits of the men were on the ground, and many began to question their loyalty to Hitler. A letter expresses those doubts as follows. The Fuhrer made us a promise to get us out of here, and we firmly believed him. Even now I keep the faith, because I have to believe in something. All my life, at least eight years of it, I believed in the Fuhrer and his word, but it is terrible how others doubt, and I am ashamed to listen to complaints without being able to answer them, because the facts are on their side. Morale was so low that even winning a fight did not cheer the Germans, who were already fed up with so much death and suffering. We can see this feeling embodied in this writing. On Tuesday I destroyed two Soviet tanks, and then walked past the smoking wreckage. A body hung from the turret, head down, its feet trapped, its legs burning up to the knees. The body was alive, the mouth grimacing in horrible pain, but there was no chance of freeing him. Even if there had been, he would have died after a few hours of torture. I shot him, and when I did, tears ran down my cheeks. Now I have been crying for three nights for that dead Russian tanker, whose murderer I am. I'm afraid I'll never sleep peacefully again if I come back to you. My life is a terrible contradiction, a psychological monstrosity. Despite Hitler's orders to defend Stalingrad at any cost and not hand it over to the Soviets, General Friedrich Paulus had no choice but to negotiate the surrender of the German army in February 1943. It is estimated that the Germans and their allies suffered between 700 and 870,000 casualties, 900 planes shot down, 1,500 tanks destroyed and 6,000 pieces of artillery disabled. On the Soviet side, things were no better, since they suffered more than a million casualties and lost 2,700 planes, 4,300 tanks and 15,000 artillery pieces. Case Blue was a failure, although the German soldiers were relieved to learn of the surrender since, as we can see, the experience was hell. We have reached the end of the video and we want to ask you, what do you think was the scariest thing about the Battle of Stalingrad? In July 1943, two gigantic armies met on the outskirts of the city of Korsk. Soldiers on both sides were aware that one of the fiercest battles ever was about to take place, and that its outcome would be key in defining the course of World War II. For Hitler, it was about regaining control of the Eastern Front. For the Russians, the goal was to break through the lines of the Third Reich in advance into the very heart of the Nazi Empire. The stakes were high, the German army and the Soviet army knew it, and they were prepared to go to the last consequences. A total of 3 million men, 4,400 aircraft and an impressive 6,300 tanks prepared to fight. Never before had so many tanks been deployed, but the situation was critical, and both sides understood that these vehicles would be decisive. What happened next was a real carnage that brought a few surprises for both armies. But, what were the causes of that confrontation? Join us for a new episode of Military History about Korsk, the largest tank battle in history. To understand the reasons for this battle, we have to go back a few months, to the Battle of Stalingrad. There, Hitler was defeated by the Soviets, who launched a brutal counteroffensive that forced the German forces back. The Fuhrer believed that this gave a bad image to his allies, Italy and Japan, who, seeing this situation, were considering the possibility of surrendering. Defeating the Red Army was necessary to regain the initiative, raise the spirits of the Wehrmacht, encourage the Axis countries to continue fighting and, incidentally, get Russian prisoners to force them to work in German military factories.
Hitler devised a cunning plan to exterminate the Soviets. He chose the Kursk salient as his battlefield, a territory 250 kilometers long and 160 kilometers wide that jutted into the German zone, with the idea of luring the Red Army there and attacking it by surprise with a pincer movement. The Soviet Union, however, was not going to let itself be surprised, it had known of Hitler's intentions for months thanks to British spies, so it had time to organize an adequate defense. The Red Army mobilized 300,000 civilians to build six defensive lines, each consisting of fortifications, minefields, barbed wire, trenches, bunkers, and anti-tank obstacles. Everything was prepared so that the 8,000 kilometers of Korsk trenches would become a death trap for Hitler's forces, who once there would have no escape. Although the Fuhrer learned of the Soviet defenses, this did not alter his plans, and he decided to attack anyway, knowing that he would lose thousands of troops, but hoping to destroy the Red Army. The numbers of the armies were surprising considering that both had been worn out for months by their efforts in World War II. The Red Army was left in charge of General Zhukov and was made up of 1,300,000 men, 3,300 tanks, 20,000 artillery pieces and 2,400 planes. For its part, the German army was in the hands of Marshal Erich von Manstein, and had 900,000 men, 2,700 tanks, 9,000 artillery pieces and 2,000 aircraft. Half of the Soviet Union's tanks were at Korsk, as they were needed to counter powerful state-of-the-art Nazi tanks. The German armored force was 90 Ferdinand tank destroyers, 211 Tiger heavy tanks and 259 Panther tanks. This last model is usually considered as one of the best tanks of World War II, the ace up the sleeve of the Wehrmacht since it was light and fast, had excellent firepower at great distances and a resistant armor. Meanwhile, the Soviets deployed their T-60 and T-70 tanks, although their main weapon was the T-34, a medium tank with armor powerful enough to withstand enemy artillery. The battle began on July 4, with a series of bombing raids on Soviet defenses and marching German tanks. As the Nazis were making a pincer movement, the battle had two fronts, in the north the Soviet defense was successful and the Germans were unable to advance more than 10 kilometers into the territory. In the south the situation was different, the Red Army could not stop Hitler's soldiers, who penetrated their lines and reached the small town of Prokhorovka, where a particularly bloody battle took place. There, the tanks clashed and filled the battlefield with smoke, blood and dead, and most of the German main battle tanks were destroyed by mines and hidden Soviet anti-tank artillery. The Soviets succeeded at Prokhorovka but at great cost, as their losses were also huge. General von Manstein was convinced that, despite the casualties, the battle could still be won. He asked Hitler for permission to deploy the tank reserve and launch one last attack on the Soviets, who were exhausted after so many days of fighting. But the Fuhrer ignored von Manstein's advice and chose to guard the reserve, his caution being that the Allies had landed in Sicily and he did not want to risk losing all his tanks. In order not to be surrounded by his enemies, the Nazi leader withdrew his forces from Korsk and diverted them towards Italy. The Soviets took advantage of the withdrawal, and on July 15 they began a sweeping counteroffensive that allowed them to drive the Germans out of their territory and win the fight. At the end of the battle, the Third Reich had lost 200,000 men, 700 tanks and almost 680 planes. Surprisingly, Red Army casualties were much higher, as they lost 850,000 soldiers, 6,000 tanks, and 1,600 aircraft. However, these figures are controversial and there are those who claim that Soviet casualties were even higher. The Battle of Korsk was a turning point and its consequences extended throughout the rest of the war. After this defeat, Hitler's plans to conquer Russia were definitively shattered and he never managed to regain the war initiative. From this moment on he went on the defensive, fighting on several fronts simultaneously, but in increasingly worse conditions, as he had the Allies on his heels from the south, and the Red Army advancing unchecked from the east. The fate of the Third Reich was sealed. Several experts claim that Germany's tactics were superior, but they lost their advantage by not breaking through the Soviet defenses, added to the fact that the Red Army had more resources 
and was willing to sacrifice all of them in order to achieve a victory. There was also another important factor in the outcome of the battle, Hitler was used to ignoring his commanders, constantly intervening in their decisions and battle plans. The Soviet leader, Stalin, fully trusted his officers throughout the engagement and let them plan the tactical details without opposing them, giving them complete freedom of action. What do you think would have happened if Hitler did not withdraw his forces from Korsk and continue the attack? The final chapter in the destruction of the Third Reich began in April 1945, when Stalin launched a brutal attack into the heart of Nazi Germany. The objective was clear, Berlin had to fall under the Soviet occupation, as it had been stipulated in the strategies agreed with the Western Allied nations. The Battle of Berlin was the last major confrontation in Europe, and it was an unequal combat that saw German officers sending children and the elderly to certain death. On the other side, the ferocious Red Army sought to liberate Europe, but also to exact revenge after years of fighting. The violence with which the Soviet soldiers acted was marked in the memory of Berliners, whether military or civilian. In this new military history video we are going to review the last weeks of Berlin under Nazi control, and what was the perspective of the locals before the advance of the powerful army of Joseph Stalin. Join us to find out everything about this crucial event. On January 12, 1945, the Red Army began its approach to German territory during the Vistula Offensive, advancing west at high speed until temporarily halted 40 miles east of Berlin. The Soviet Union waited for the right moment to launch the last great offensive against the Third Reich, and it remained there for several months, until April of that same year. On the other side, the first preparations to defend the outskirts of Berlin began on March 20, when the newly appointed General Gotthard Heinrichsai correctly anticipated that Soviet troops would seek to cross the Oder River. Tension continued until April 16, 1945, when the first Belarusian Front, led by Marshal of the Soviet Union, Georgi Zhukov, began shelling central Berlin. Simultaneously, the first Ukrainian front pushed the rest of the Nazi defenses south. During the months leading up to the Battle of Berlin, the inhabitants became familiar with the sirens that warned of air raids by Allied bombers. When the Anglo-American attacks stopped, many thought it was the end of the brutality, but they were soon met with the power of Soviet urban weaponry. The Red Army artillery remained etched in the memory of the millions of soldiers and townspeople who fought on both sides of the war. Ironically, for some people, the Soviet presence was preferable to American bombing. One of the main sources of information regarding Berlin experiences is the diary of a German soldier's girlfriend, which says that women adapted to terrible circumstances in order to survive. Beginning on April 20, 1945, Ten days before Adolf Hitler's suicide, the anonymous author describes the scenes of her neighbors during the bombing of Berlin. The woman says that people ran to the shelter that was in her building. She also describes three elderly sisters who remained in each other's arms all the time and used to joke. Better a Rusky on top than a Yankee on the head. In other words, that it was preferable to be raped by members of the Red Army than to be pulverized by American bombing. April 22, 1945, was a special morning for the Germans in Berlin. That day they woke up with the typical ration of 200 grams of bread, 36 grams of meat and 18 grams of lard, but in addition, the Führer sent a blunt statement, anyone who proposes or approves measures that go against our power or resilience is a traitor, and will be shot or hanged immediately. The atmosphere in the city became apocalyptic, with executions and torture of the Germans themselves at the hands of the SS. Soon even children and grandparents were called upon to defend the city with little hope of survival. Werner Eckert, who lived through the Battle of Berlin as a child, recalls, anyone who put a white arm band to surrender was executed by the SS. I saw the corpses hanging in the city. I even had to write a poster for one of them, 
it said I am a coward, and I wanted to lead the Third Reich to communism, it was the worst thing I experienced as a boy. From street to street, from house to house, the Russian troops fought their way to reach Hitler's chancellery in the heart of the capital. The Third Reich was finished. It was the end of the reign of terror, or so it seemed. We tried to look as unattractive as possible before the Soviets came, we hurt our faces, we covered ourselves in dust and coal. We huddled together in droves and trembled to appear ill. We were scared to see the Red Army soldiers, recalls Dorothea von Schweinenflugel, a 29-year-old mother who lived in Berlin with her daughter. In Treptower Park, on the outskirts of Berlin, stands a statue about 12 meters high. It is the representation of a Soviet soldier with a sword in one hand and a German girl in the other, stepping on a broken swastika. This marks the place where 5,000 of the 80,000 Red Army soldiers who fell in Berlin between April 16 and May 2, 1945 died. The proportion of the monument seeks to reflect the scale of the sacrifice, the inscription indicates that the Soviet people helped save European civilization from fascism and the horrors it entailed. For others, more ironically, it is also a monument to the rapist soldiers who took advantage of the chaos of the ruined capital. There are records of countless cases of sexual violence committed by Red Army troops in the German capital, as if the vexation were part of the revenge promise to the infamous Third Reich. The Russian media often describe these claims as Western myths that seek to disqualify the enormous Soviet sacrifice during World War II, but the truth is that these crimes were also recorded in the diaries of several young Soviet soldiers. One of the most famous sources is the diary of the young Ukrainian lieutenant Vladimir Gelfand, who describes with brutal frankness his experiences on the European fronts. In February 1945, Gelfand was stationed near the dam on the Oder River, where the army was preparing for the final blow on Berlin. There he tells how his comrades surrounded and annihilated battalions of German women fighters. The German cats we captured said they were avenging their dead husbands, the lieutenant writes, we must destroy them without mercy. Our soldiers suggest stabbing them in their genitals, but I would only execute them. One of the most shocking passages in Gelfand's diary was written on April 25th, when Soviet troops were already in Berlin. The lieutenant recounts that he was riding a bicycle along the Spree River when he ran into a group of German women carrying suitcases and packages. With his precarious German, the soldier asked where they were going. One of the women confessed that no fewer than 20 Russian men had attacked her the night before, taking turns abusing her. By then the abuses and violations committed by German soldiers in the Soviet Union over the past four years were already widely known, and Gelfand himself had seen its consequences firsthand as they fought their way into Germany. On April 30th, Adolf Hitler committed suicide along with many of his senior officials and staunch supporters, putting an end to the Third Reich and one of the darkest periods in human history. The Soviet Union wanted to take Berlin on May 1st, so that the fall of the Reich would coincide with Workers' Day, but finally the surrender happened the next day. Some street fighting continued to the northwest and southeast until Nazi Germany's unconditional surrender on May 8, 1945. After this experience, many Germans marched west to surrender to the Western Allies before being captured by the Soviets. We have reached the end of this video. Remember to subscribe and activate notifications to keep up to date with all our news. For the moment, we say goodbye until the next installment of Military History.